Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lunch Break Science. I'm Ariel from the Leakey Foundation, where we support human evolution research and share the incredible stories behind it. Today, I have an update to share. Lunch Break Science is taking a break for the next few months. The team and I are working on an exciting new project and exploring what is next for Lunch Break Science. And we would love for you to be part of it. Let us know what you've enjoyed most about the series and what you'd like to see in the future. We want your thoughts to help guide us as we look ahead. Science and education have never been more important or more in need of support. Understanding who we are, where we come from, and what makes us human is vital. And this work depends on your support. This series has been possible because of you, your curiosity, your questions, and your generosity. Whether you've been watching us from the beginning or just discovered us recently, we're grateful for every comment, every question, and every moment you've spent with us. Check the links in the video description to discover how you can play a role in shaping the future of human evolution research and education. So today, we're celebrating the journey so far. We've gathered some of our favorite moments, the discoveries, the surprising insights, and the scientists who have shared their passion with us. We hope you enjoy this look back as much as we do. Before we begin, though, we want to thank our sponsors, the Anne and Gordon Getty Foundation, Camilla and George Smith, the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund, and of course, all of you who have watched, shared, and supported this series. Now, let's take a look at some of the moments that have made Lunch Break Science so special. Uh, we were looking uh, for hominin fossils in the Liai Doita locality in the Lady Gararu uh, research site. And at one point, I decided to look around in, the, in that particular hill. And uh, after a few minutes of my survey, I saw a piece of tooth sticking out of the loose sediments um, and just like, oh, I immediately realized that is uh, a harmony to peace. And then uh, I sat uh, I sat down and I pulled uh, out part of a jaw and uh, I immediately saw a fresh break from the jaw. Uh, so uh, I knew there is something around because it is a fresh break then continued my search and uh, found the other piece of the jaw in about two minutes, uh, which perfectly um, fit with the other part of the uh, jaw, which I already found. So, uh, and then I, I called everyone to come over and celebrate. And uh, as you can imagine, everyone was running and just, uh, uh, Come, uh, just they came to the where I found the fossil, and just we start celebrating. Are humans the most social primate? Um, I think that probably depends on you how you define um, what being social is. We certainly are very complicated social primates. I mean, one of the reasons that we study, I guess I probably didn't mention this, that we study other, other primates is because um, by and large, I mean, they're complicated, but we can summarize their um, social hierarchies in kind of like a single dimensional measure. Whereas humans, we do these amazing things where we interact with multiple layers of society simultaneously. So, yeah. you know, you could be, um, highly integrated in your uh, your church, but relatively isolated at work. You could be high status on your baseball team, but you know, low status in another sort of circumstance. So um, I don't know that we depend more on, on, on positive social interactions than other primates do. Um, the, the effect sizes in other primates are actually like where they've been estimated are very similar to, to humans, but we certainly complicate it the most. So maybe I'll answer it that We way. sure do. 
know where do we fit in um, in the great uh, in, the, in the great scheme of life you know or one of the, uh, the core questions that humans have always wondered about is um, you know what is our place in nature and in order to be able to answer that question uh, we need to know who our closest relatives are and we need to know how um, you know the pathways that we took from the ancestors we share with those closest relatives up to the point where we we are today you know like we say that um, if you don't know where you're coming from then you don't know where you're going so if we need to know where we're headed in the in the future we need to have a good sense about where we come from and uh, the second uh, reason we are interested in probably a more personal reason is uh, because you know just having a black skin can be an existential threat it has been an existential threat for people like me with the black skin because of the existence of this uh, racial caste system that we've created based on a misconception about how uh, evolution works in order to create um, a rank order and uh, and so by uh, properly understanding how evolution really works and how things are really related i think we um we are then on our way to deconstructing this racial caste system. So I do have, uh, as a black person, I do have uh, a much more immediate reason why I'm interested in the study of the evolution of uh, humans and apes. This is just a part of a phylogeny, the way in which we organize the different types of primates. And the very simple point that I want to make here is that we do see male primates taking care of young in different groups of primates. Towards the right of the slide, you can see homo, human beings, of course it happens, hylobates in blue as well, the gibbons of Southeast Asia. But then I want to call your attention to the two kind of pinkish boxes that are signaling owl monkeys, genus Aeotus, and titty monkeys, genus Calicibus. And this is something that may come up later when we go on another round of questions. But notice that Iotus and Calicibus, at least in this phylogeny, are not that closely related. But both taxa show wonderful dots. Now, both taxa, the titty monkeys that I'm showing you here on the left and the other monkeys on the right, live in small group. They are pair living monkeys and they are pair living one male and one female form a pair, they establish a bond. That is already somewhat unusual among primates, and we think that maybe may have played an important role in the evolution of male-female relationships in our early ancestors. Both taxa, titis and almanchis, also have a lot of paternal care. Again, illustrated here on the left by a male titi monkey transporting an infant, and on the right by an owl monkey transporting an infant. I go back to the first few slides. I mean, you, you wouldn't see this kind of affinity. You wouldn't see this kind of close connection between male and infant in most mammals, in, definitely not in the ones that I showed you before, but in most mammals. You see them only in some, you see it in some primates, nowhere you see the extent of engagement of males with infants that we see in owl monkeys and titi monkeys. This is uh, a discovery that was made in 2016. Um, I, I got to tell you that this is one of the most complete and undistorted crania that has ever been discovered in the fossil record older than 3 million years. And it was really exciting to find it because we, we were able to learn more about what this specimen belongs to and what it means in terms of how we interpret our understanding of um, early human uh, evolution, particularly during the Middle Pliocene. So the MRD cranium started with this discovery of the upper jaw, which was um, discovered by a local Afar guy, um, Ali Bereno. And um, about three meters away from it, there was the rest of the head, which <laughs> which was really interesting. He he probably thought that was some kind of a rock. So he, he recognized the teeth, but not not the rest of the, the cranium. But when I saw it, obviously there was it was clear to me that those two pieces would join. And uh, I picked it up, and when I tried it, it was a perfect joint. So 
that was when I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing uh, because this is, we, we know that this was really old and uh, even looking at it, it just doesn't look like anything that I have seen before. So we know that there was, it was gonna be something very, very interesting. But as, 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 as it's always the case with uh, fossils, um, you, don't, you don't find them complete. There's always something missing, right? And as paleoanthropologists, we don't usually pick up whatever we find on the ground and run away, particularly for specimens like uh, like this. And we had to do the usual um, crawling, sifting, uh, and um, excavation sometimes. But in this case, it was it did not require excavation, but it did require a lot of sieving uh, and picking so that we can uh, recover the remaining pieces in case they're, all, they're there, they just broke and fell off and they were like in, in the dirt. So it took us a few days to actually sift this, um, the, the, the sediments there. And we were rewarded with, with like four or five pieces that were really, really crucial to make the uh, cranium more complete. So what we had at the beginning were the two pieces. And as you can see here, it doesn't have the orbital margins and you can't really see the face that much without those regions. And we were really lucky when we found those four pieces that actually joined the uh, the left orbit. As you can see here, those four, four pieces were really critical. And once you have these pieces, thanks to technology, you can do a lot of things, right? You can you can reconstruct the remaining pieces on the, uh, the right side using what's preserved on uh, the left side. So what we did was we um, got it CT scanned and did uh, the reconstruction and you end up with this beautiful cranium, which is very interesting, not only in terms of its completeness, but also the morphology that we're seeing on this specimen. And uh, it now gives us a great idea uh, on the cranial anatomy of Australopithecus afrensis, which we didn't have much knowledge about. And it's also based on those kinds of reconstructions that you can actually have the first glimpse of the face of Australopithecus anamensis. And John Gerchi, a paleo artist who's been doing this for many years, was commissioned to do the reconstruction. And he came up with a really, really uh, great reconstruction, flesh reconstruction of uh, this, this cranium. And that's what he gave us in the end. And now we can compare what the face of Lucy looks like relative to its ancestor Australopithecus anamensis. I documented, you know, the GPS coordinates. Um, we took binoculars looking around and we actually stumbled on a really beautiful site uh, which we didn't know. So on the side of these um, huge cliffs, uh, there were some beautiful waterfalls that we didn't actually know were there. Um, and so it was really a breathtaking site. It was so beautiful. And so um, we just stood there, you know, like started looking, documenting vegetation, um, keeping a lookout just in case we see them. And our efforts were rewarded. We actually spotted first uh, a few individuals on the side of the cliff. And I was so excited that I actually ran up to the side of the cliff and was trying to, you know, peer over. And one of my colleagues and friends had to like pull me back and he was like, you're on the edge of that cliff. <laughs> and so when we saw them, you know, um, it was a really amazing sight because, you know, you hear about it, you read about it, but actually going out and seeing them was really amazing. And we saw a group of them with, uh, you know, a male leader and several females uh, that you can see in the picture um, with their infants. And they were just spending their time, you know, um, on the ground eating uh, leaves and plants that they can um, find. So it was really amazing for us to confirm that they were there. Too. Yeah, so there's been uh, a Makuso fig tree, which is one of the chimps' favorite foods, uh, fruiting really close to camp. So yesterday I only had to walk uh, about 10 minutes to get to a good group of chimpanzees. There's a lot of feeding, but also grooming and playing. Um, and so one of the most fun things I saw yesterday was adult male Miles, uh, one of the stars of Chimp Empire, um, playing with a juvenile, Kano. And we don't get to see males playing with uh, little kids every day, so that was very fun.
Oh, what's all my favorite <laughs> fossil from Laetoli? It's hard to pick, right? <laughs> yeah, there are so many fossils actually which has been discovered at Laetoli uh, by either by uh, Mary, uh, Terry Harrison, and myself. But my favorite fossil is the Laetoli mandible, which is known as Laetoli hominid 4. And this is a holotype specimen, uh, Phosphoropithecus afarensis from Laetoli. And so this mandible is dated about 3.6 million years old. It's so well preserved, um, and it's actually, it's, it retains a lot of details. Uh, and, and everyone who looks at it, it says, oh yeah, this looks like a human, a human mandible, a human jaw. So it's my favorite. And I always like to start talks about chimpanzee communication by actually telling you a little bit about one of my favorite chimpanzee vocalizations um, called a pant hoot. And this is one of my favorite calls. It's one of the calls that when we're out in the forest with the chimpanzees, we, we hear it actually quite frequently. So it's a commonly given uh, signal and it, it's really, it can be quite loud. Um, and so we'll hear it even from far away from a mile or two away in the forest. Um, and it's it's a really interesting talk and I, or con call. And I'm gonna pant hoot for you. If, you. if you put it all together, it sounds a little bit like uh, this, which is so that's my not necessarily very accurate uh, pant hoot. A chimpanzee would not necessarily think that I was a chimp, but I think you hopefully could hear all four parts. Um, and now I'm gonna just actually play a video so you can uh, hear and see what chimpanzees look like when, you're pant when they're pant hooting. And the thing about this video to just pay attention to, you'll actually see two chimps together pant hooting. And then if you wait till after they pant hoot, you'll hear other chimps farther away responding to them. Thank you again for watching and for being part of the Lunch Break Science community. Your curiosity, questions, and support have made the series what it is, and we're so grateful to share this journey with you. Until we meet again, stay curious, stay inspired, and as always, stay hungry for knowledge. Lunch Break Science is brought to you by the Leakey Foundation and made possible by the generous support of the Ann and Gordon Getty Foundation, Camilla and George Smith, and the Joan and Arnold Travis Education Fund, as well as viewers like you. Show your support of Lunch Break Science by subscribing to our channel, clicking on notifications, and giving us a thumbs up, or making a donation to help us create new content. Still craving science and can't wait for the next episode? You can feast on the Leaky Foundation's content library with past episodes, lectures, our podcast origin stories, and more. Thank you all for tuning in and see you next time.